our um, second to last um, gathering on conversation. So I'm so grateful to Daniel for doing today because I'm preaching today. And I was like, oh, that would be really nice tonight. <laughs> So, so I'm grateful to you for doing that. And we have one more um, conversation next week for Palm Sunday. We're going to have a slightly different arrangement. Is there's going to be a whole bunch of flowers right here. So we're going to move over there for the for Palm Sunday next week. That'll be our last um, gathering on, on conversations. But thank you, Daniel, for, for today. Well, I'm glad to uh, be able to be here with you all this morning. Um, and it's kind of nice to not have to uh, be free. So it's a nice little trade off. Um, today we're going to be continuing. Uh, Audrey sent me her presentation, uh, or one of the presentation examples, and um, you uh, talk about one of my favorite Elvis songs, Suspicious Minds, uh, <laughs> Caught in a Trap. Uh, and so the conversation today that Jesus has with his disciples kind of reminded me of an, uh, a song from 1987. I was sure it was from the 90s, and it turns out it was a little older than that, 1987. Uh, it's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. Does anyone know that song? All right, we'll talk about it in a minute. Um, but for now, um, Audrey, you might be in the sorry. Yeah. Yeah. sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, we will open with prayer. We'll consider the topic of Jesus in the 1980s and, and 1980s indie rock music. Uh, not really, just kidding, <laughs> kind of. Uh, we'll talk about some pop culture stuff. Um, we'll read our scripture and then break into some conversation groups. So uh, we're kind of smaller in number today, so we might have some um, smaller groups, but that's all right. But for now, let's uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Uh, here's our prayer of the day. We may need the other. Um, and I was thinking, let's make this an interactive prayer. I would invite you um, to whatever line speaks to you. We're just going to read this together, one line at a time. I'll start it off uh, reading that first line. And then if you want to call out and read a line, that would be great. Um, if two of you start reading the same line, that's great too. Just keep going. Um, you know, on Zoom, when we would start to talk at the same time, you go, ah, uh, 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 you, uh. so that may happen. That's okay. But we're going to pray this uh, prayer of the day together. Let us pray. Blessed God, we thank you. For all the blessings of this life. For the gift of Christ. For the gift of the Holy Spirit. Be a great sign from heaven. May your peace. Bend our will to your will. Like trees in a strong wind. Signs of heaven, signs of hope. Okay, uh, maybe with a partner, maybe someone who uh, is not your partner or spouse, um, try to find someone that you're, uh, you're not, you don't go home with at the end of the day. Uh, what are three things on your bucket list? You so I'm going to say so there are people who love this question or who hate this question. Yeah. We can talk about why uh, afterward. But yeah. if you can't think of three, I'll settle for one or two. Uh, let's call one another back together. Um, I'm just curious. First of all, we were saying, um, some of you came in. Uh, is this a question that you love or you hate? Let's see if you love this question. No, no one loves this question. If you hate this question. Ooh, it's so oh, wow. interesting. Uh, <laughs> so interesting. We have this book at home that someone gave us. It's called A Thousand and One Places to Visit Before You Die. Oh, uh, you never seen that. And I never really thought about a bucket list that way. That it's just sort of like before you take the bucket. I know I mean I know that, but I always thought it's sort of like something that adds to your life. Yeah. You know, things that 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 sort of make your life blossom, not sort of like thinking about death. You know, my stepdad, I remember him saying, like, I don't want to think about what I'm, you know, my dad. I was like, no, well, I'm not thinking about death. I'm thinking about life. So anyway, what were some of the things that you said? Just call out. Yeah. Going to New Zealand. Going to New Zealand. It's a great one. I loved what Lee said, so Lee, you have to speak. Oh, we just don't have bucket lists. It's kind of a foreign concept, and we just kind of think that it's uh, really bring the focus onto yourself mm -hmm. and kind of not uh, exactly what 
our faith is all about. So mm -hmm. fair enough. I would like someone seriously to explain to me um, what a bucket has to do with this. Um, seriously, I'm not just saying that for this morning's session. I've often thought, whoa, 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 how, what's with the bucket? I, I can't it, make the connection between. It's before you kick the bucket. These are oh, the big things. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's about dying. Then. Yes. <laughs> That's what my said that I'm I, like, no, it's about dying I, before you kick I the bucket. I did not. I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Any, any other things on your list? All right. Well, let's uh, let's move on. Okay. So today we're gonna um, we're Audrey's gonna be preaching from Mark 13, which um, begins kind of the whole chapter. 13 of Mark's gospel is what's called a little apocalyptic. It gives us a little sense for uh, the apocalypse, the end times. And so, um, you know, Mark is only 16 chapters long. So that one entire chapter is devoted to this idea of the end times uh, could be kind of significant, but scholars refer to this, uh, this section that begins with the, the text that Audrey's using today as Mark's little apocalyptic. Uh, but first, anybody know uh, the song by R.E.M. It's the end of the world as we know it. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Hit song. Uh, I, I was telling others earlier, I was convinced it was a 1990s song. It actually came out in 1987. Um, I, here, this may sound familiar, but it's kind of fast. Anyway. Okay, so uh, we get to the chorus eventually, and it's, it's the end of the world as we know it, it's the end of the world as we know it, it's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. <laughs> Um, it's funny too, uh, we'll read in the text in a moment, but you know, the, the song, I don't know if you caught those lyrics, but um, that's great, it starts with an earthquake, birds and snakes and airplanes and so. Um, 1987, what was going on in the world in 1987? I was very involved with raising my children. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, there's so many things that I've thought about that happened historically, and where was I and where was my mind? I was very busy with my teaching career and raising my children yeah. and supporting Dick. Yeah. I was very interested in Soviet politics. <laughs> Soviet politics. So, like, do you know what year? Do you remember what year the Berlin Wall fell? 89. 89. Do you remember what year the Soviet Union fell? 91. 91. So, in 1987, that was kind of in our consciousness, wasn't it? Like just that idea that, hey, this could be the end of the world at any moment. And I well, at, at that point in time, the, the Russians actually thought we were going to make a preemptive nuclear strike against them. Mm -hmm. um, and I've read several books recently uh, about British uh, spies uh, or the Russians that they had. Uh, that the British had had uh, recruited to spy uh, be, to be counter spies. They were uh, KGB members that were in the embassy in London, and or one of them. Anyway, um, and um, uh, who was it? Gorbachev, I think. Thought it. they they really thought, and we had a NATO exercise um, with all ships and planes and, and everything, and they finally at the culmination of the exercise was to was a nuclear strike with B-52 bombers uh, and they um, they convinced Reagan to not attend it and convinced Margaret Thatcher to not attend it uh, as signs because the Russians were so paranoid mm. that it was going to be real and that we were just using it and using the exercise as a pretense, and we are really going to have to move your codes out and make the strike. There was a really interesting story a couple months ago in the Atlantic magazine about um, about that, and that Russia actually had an automatic. It was like it, it, it was like the first AI 
really was this system that um, was designed to detect U.S. rockets and that it automatically triggered a Russian response that they could not, you know, it was, it was just sort of like if that happened and we did that, like their response was, it, it was designed to not have people second guess. But it they did various flaws. The, uh, well, yeah, we came we came this close to like annihilation. <laughs> it was new Korean, Korean Airlines flight yeah. like 007 that they that wandered off course mm -hmm. and wandered over the Vladivostok area of Russia and was shot down. down. Right. They, and they shot down a, a known airliner because the US didn't use any planes that had two rows. Of uh, a port windows mm -hmm. as a uh, as a spy plane, maybe mm -hmm. like spy planes, but we never used anything mm -hmm. like that. So, John, you well, I just uh, so I happen to travel to Russia for business purposes in uh, 1994, wow. so shortly after the fall of the Soviet Union, um, and I remember walking through dimly lit buildings mm. and seeing people in hallways waiting for somebody to tell them what to do. In other mm. words, the state had, was no longer employing them mm. and they had no purpose to wow. sit there. And this this was in empty buildings, people on sidewalks waiting for instructions of what to do. So given that the end of the world as we know it, they had an end of the world. Mm. Right. And yeah. it's important we recognize that yeah. it's all about us right. mm -hmm. and America. Mm -hmm. Other parts of the world have this same feeling at certain mm -hmm. times. Right. We shouldn't ignore that. No. Mm -hmm. When we think about Mark's little apocalypse, I mean, that was in some ways that might have been their little apocalypse. You know, we yeah. experience our. Mm -hmm. All right, let's keep uh, let's keep at it. Um, so, what are some pop culture, some other pop culture references to uh, to the end of the world? I I've been thinking about one all along. Some of us may remember it. It was a made for TV movie yes. that came out in the mm -hmm. years called The Day After. Yeah. The, the Day After. The day after. Like <laughs> <laughs> all right. The Day After. Who sounds like that? Yeah. Yeah. Resonates familiar? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was thinking of that little Left Behind series. Yeah. Left so Behind. like Prince's 1999. Yeah. 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 Tim. Let me. This is it. Well, LaHaye. Yeah. Her they were it's her camera and they were so popular no, among no, not made by Christians. Um I have a, a very, very evangelical I hate to use that word, but very conservative Christian cousin. <clears throat> and when I was visiting her, she was telling me that I needed to go to Walmart and get those big cans of vegetables and fruit. Mm. And I'm saying, why? And she said, because the end is coming and then you will have food. But not only that, after you eat the food, you will have that can to put your twigs and all in to have a fire to mm. cook oh, your wow. And so when I came home, Dick had one can sitting on the counter with <laughs> a pine cone in it. But um, I, I just, I was like, thankfully, we got to the restaurant that we were going to because I just couldn't go with that conversation. <laughs> that's, uh, yeah. but that's today, that's Friends, like a few the, years ago. Like and, or, uh, the people who sort of hoard things uh, yes. to prepare. And, and that's the thing, too. I thought, this is all about you. You're mm -hmm. going to have it for you. What about the rest of the world? Right. You know? Um, but anyway, I didn't get in any further into that. But um, remember those. Oh, sorry. Uh, but obviously, that's what her church mm. is preaching. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Remember those early days of the pandemic when you couldn't find toilet paper yeah, or, my gosh, or, or like yeast? Like, <laughs> like some like odd things. Yeah. You couldn't get yeah. Flour. And other. I, have, I have one for pop culture. Yeah, please, please. Okay, this is the Vietnam era. Yeah. <laughs> remember the song The Eagle Destruction? Yeah. Mm. yeah. Does anyone remember that one? Yeah. Oh yeah. So that's, that's, really, that's really poignant. Yeah. Think about end of the world and war and you know, what's gonna happen, right? Yeah. yeah. And the uh, students were rebelling and they weren't quite sure what they were doing. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, let's see. Anybody remember uh, the movie Independence Day from 1996? Uh, or the movie, uh, let's see, Armageddon from 1998? <laughs> Anything that was going on in 1996, 98 that might make you think about Armageddon? And granted, these. But do you remember Y2K? Do you remember how oh, cool yeah. flipped out yeah. that it was going to be like that? End of the <laughs> so around that time, there were all there were several movies uh, that came out that kind of had that apocalypse theme. Uh, more recently, Don't Look Up. Do you remember that one? Did anybody see that on Netflix? You can still watch it, but it's about uh, sort of climate change. Oh, really, right. the undercurrent is about climate change and people just. Uh, how, how, how we ignore some issues. Uh, one of them that came to mind because it's got kind of a religious undertone was uh, Signs. Did you see the movie Signs? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good one. It has kind of a turn at the end. Like um, M, M. Night Shyamalan, who is the guy who wrote it, directed it, produced it, whatever. Um, he's kind of known for those. Remember? Um, yeah. That was <laughs> Oh, wow, Bruce Willis, you're actually, anyway, uh, so science is another good one. So uh, what comes to mind, though, when you, uh, when you hear about the end times from religious people or leaders, like Marty mentioned, <laughs> uh, her experience? So but beyond pop culture, what do you hear from religious uh, people? Well, it seems like it's a lot of scaremongering, I mean, at least among the TV creatures who were, um, you know, and kind of money stuff and probably is typical of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember saying, to, I, I do remember one thing I said to my cousin, um, because she was really pointing to all the signs that this was several years ago, I mean, the end has not come, but um, she was pointing to an immediate end. And I said, well, I'm not sure where it is in the Bible, but Jesus said, you will know neither the day mm -hmm. nor the time. And she had nothing to say. <laughs> it stopped the conversation. Right. Have you ever read Revelations? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's constantly referred to, people refer to Revelations yeah. as the story of the apocalypse and right. the end of times. Right. Mm -hmm. And having scriptural authority mm -hmm. says in the Bible, therefore, uh, it's a very popular Read it. It's a very powerful book. There's some wild wow. stuff. There are some wild stuff. And in a moment, we're going to get to this text from Mark. But but what else do you just hear out there from religious people? The end times. Any other any <laughs> thoughts? Yeah. I mean, because I was a little uh, in the late seventies. I was at a Baptist church every Sunday night. We watched uh, movies on the end times. But and I was like in you know, first, second grade. So it was ingrained for them. But people are always trying to, they look at society, right? You look at what's in Revelation and well, what people were taught or what the theory is. I think we talked about this as something else where it's not, you know, the whole thing is kind of, uh, some of what some of us have learned may not or may not be directly in scripture, but everybody and it's been many years they point well now's the end time because you see this 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 and this and this you know so this adds up so it's just like a constant of guessing and to lee's point of fear monitoring you're always telling people well now's it you know we had the pandemic now's it i mean and i was one on 9 11 i saw george bush and i was like all right he's safe so this is not the end because i was by myself <laughs> Yeah, I was by myself. I was flying back from, uh, wow. I'd been in Mississippi and I had a layover in St. Louis and, you know, and I'm in the airport when everything's falling down. And I was like, all right, you know, W's, W's there. All right. So, you know, I'm on the phone, but, you know, it's like what you, you know, I thought I was like, all right, so I'm still here. <laughs> I'm still here. Yeah. I feel like, I know, maybe I'm wrong. But I feel like conversations like this um, among mainline people like us, um, we don't really know what to do <laughs> with these conversations <laughs> because they seem like they're for you know your sort of evangelical cousin or the wacko preacher or the um, but these texts are here and we have to sort of deal with them or wrestle with them or at least consider them. 
Um, so uh, with that, let's kind of get to our text for today, which is from uh, Mark's Gospel, chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. Um, would anyone who's close enough to see or comfortable enough to do it read our text for us? As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. And Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. It will all will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell me, when will this be, and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am me, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be no earth, sorry, there will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth of kings. Yes. I <laughs> mean, look, and I've had conversations with, but it's hard not to look at what's going on and not to, like, if you've been raised this way, to think, ah, you know. This could be it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, because there are, but then there's probably always been a lot of things that you could fit into. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, uh, so what, if anything, is the text saying to you? Well, I think it's interesting if you read the first paragraph, which I think are verse one and two. We just talked about, oh, the, 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 the temple's going to fall over. And us mainline Christians say, oh, Jesus is predicting his death. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then it takes an end. When, when, if you read the second paragraph, you're like, no, that's not, that's not what's going on. And so it seems to me it's so often with the Bible, if we know when to stop, we can make it say what we want it to. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny, I read uh, one commentary on this text, and the commentator was saying, you know, when you're, when I, he's like, usually when I read that first, the, this, this first uh, verse or two, um, in the prayers, uh, he, he said, whatever, um, one of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings, and he said, I hear the voice of Gom Gomer Pyle going, what, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> it's like, but like in in maybe what it, re it is really like seriously, seriously, like these are huge. If you've ever seen like the temple in Jerusalem, some of the stone some of those stones are literally 40 feet long. So, and like this is gonna come in, but really, you know, it's a bit so reading scripture uh, means of course that we bring our own interpretation to mm -hmm. these words. And um, one of the things I think of, it, that this is an elaborate metaphor for Jesus talking about the destruction of the privileged elite mm -hmm. and how 5% of the population owned and controlled 95% of the wealth mm -hmm. and everybody else was serving that elite. And to some extent, that message at that time yeah. could have been received by people in that way. Yeah. I'm not saying, by the way, that you shouldn't read this as a larger metaphor for us, but I think it's important that we understand the time and what Jesus might have been saying to certain yeah. groups then. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and we're going to come to that in a moment. Uh, yeah, I think the do not be alarmed thing is probably, you know, almost what I take away mm. from it the most. Mm -hmm. That it's beyond my it's beyond our control and you know and Jesus says do not be alarmed yeah yeah yeah, yeah I, I feel the same I feel as God's God's in charge yeah and we can worry about all these things there's always going to be something to worry about but um, don't give up yeah so all right. Right. yes yes indeed all right so let's uh, go ahead maybe one or two yeah okay so some context so. In the end of chapter, so this is uh, chapter 13, verse 1. In the end of chapter 12, do you know that passage about the woman who um, puts her pennies in the treasury mm -hmm. of the temple, um, her two little copper coins, and um, Jesus says, well, surely she's given more than all those others and made a big show of giving their 
their fat checks because this woman gave all she had, right? So if that sets the, the, the context a little bit in terms of place, they're, you know, that takes, you know, they're watching what's going on. Jesus and the disciples are watching what's going on at the temple. Now we're in chapter 13, and um, he's talking about the temple. In fact, there's that part, I don't know if you saw it there, where they sat down opposite the temple. And it's uh, interesting, like, little translation word play. Um, the word that we translate as opposite is, is kind of a, the same word that we might also translate as, like, over and against. Um, so it, it could be like a metaphorical, like they, they positioned themselves over and against the temple and what was going on there. So it's not just opposite, like, oh, you know, the temple's there and they're there on opposite sides. <clears throat> like, so it's just kind of an interesting little, uh, wordplay, but so the continuation, um, uh, of chapter 13, what, uh, so after this, um, there's a bit where Jesus tells his disciples what to say uh, when they are going to be put on trial on, a, on his account. And basically, it's like, don't worry about it. The Holy Spirit will give you the words. <laughs> um, but this is it. This is the little apocalyptic, the whole chapter. Let's keep going. Uh, and uh, so anybody know when Mark was written? Any idea? Yeah, I, I, sixty-five. I a little sense that it was after Paul's letters had been written. Yes, I think it was around seventy yep. A.C.E. and I think he was writing largely for a Roman um, Jewish Christian audience that was suffering under Nero. Am I right, Matthew? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no. Yes, you are right about the year. Yeah, uh, whether it was they don't really know. Who maybe it could be? It could be a Roman Jewish audience, but they don't really know. Um, but it was around the year seven. It was just about the time of the destruction of the temple, which was also around the year seven. That's right. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, the second temple, you know, the temple was destroyed the second time around this same time. And so, when you read this, let's go to the next slide. Um, that commentator, the one you talked about, uh, the Gomer pile, he says, uh, most likely, Mark is writing this text long after the death and resurrection of Jesus. So that was, you know, like, what, 33-ish? Uh, now we're at 70-ish, so it's quite a bit of time. Uh, at a time when the temple is either undergoing destruction, is already destroyed, or is in imminent threat of being destroyed. Mark's own language throughout this chapter seems to indicate that this is not merely a prediction or a prophecy of Jesus, but a text whose narrator is embedded in the destruction, as destructive event itself. So the Jewish revolt, the Jewish rebellion, began around the year 66. So, like, that's the context. Remember, we're thinking about, like, what was going on in the world when Independence Day and Armageddon was happening? What was happening, you know, in 1987 when REM said, it's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. So, like, in Mark's context, that's, you know, that's what's going on. The Jews are uprising against Rome. Um, they are revolting. And in the year 70, around when we wind up writing this gospel, the temple comes down. And thousands of Jews were yes. killed. Yes. Yes. So Mark is writing these words of Jesus, setting them in his current context, but saying, well, this was what Jesus said, you know, 30 some 40 years ago. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so let's now break into some conversation groups. Uh, we can meet in tables or online. Uh, five or six of you together. Um, However, you want to, I'm, I'm terrible at that part. But uh, here are a couple questions to uh, to talk about first. Um, what do you think mainline Christians like Presbyterians have to say about the end times? Like, do we have something to offer as an alternative to our more evangelical uh, siblings in faith? Like, what can we say that speaks to them? And then, you know, what do you think mainline Christians like Presbyterians have to say about the current times? So, some big questions to uh, <laughs> to discuss, but you don't have to do it alone. You're in group, so if some of you want to come over here, I'm going to have our online folks with some of you all, so we can move around and we can sort of take this. I'd like to uh, share or report back about what mainline yeah. Christians, <laughs> like Presbyterians, have to say about the uh, end times. Any thoughts? 
brilliance um <laughs> five years <laughs> it's hard isn't it we don't talk about it we don't yeah i think we're afraid to be labeled as people <laughs> you know who obsess over it or we don't want to be associated with so we well i think at our table um we talked about what we can do um not necessarily that the, the thought is the world's going to end soon, mm -hmm. but what what can we do about it? Um, so there's hope. Mm -hmm. at, at this table, at least there was hope about what the end times mean for us mm -hmm. and what we should do. I love that. I, I shared with my group. Um, I was I was raised in a conservative evangelical. Tradition, not as extreme as Marnie, but it, it was Marnie's kind. Marnie's kind. <laughs> Marnie's <cut. laughs> <laughs> <laughs> Marnie's kind. Yeah. I want to say Marnie's kind. There was almost a continual, like almost harangue, like a one to one correspondence. For example, uh, you're all probably, well, we're all. Old, but uh, there was this book, The Late Great Planet Earth, in 1967. Um, it came out of Dallas Theological Seminary. I don't know where that seminary is at today, but at the time it was in the vanguard of dispensationalism. And you kind of link literally like the 1967 war in Israel, like that was like a major, like we know the world is, we're, we're on the way out. Yeah. Of Israel is back in, you know, in their homeland. I'm just saying, I, I'm coming from the other, you, all you had to do was link a verse with um, a happening. Mm -hmm. And it was all fairly cut and dry. And I never, as a child and a teenager and a young adult, and even as a middle-aged adult, I never felt comfortable. With that, and I'm relieved to be out of and away from from that. That's all I'm saying. Mike. I think I think historians of post-war America frequently reference that book oh. as a really important one in terms of shifting the views of a segment of the American exactly. citizenry, you know, in mm -hmm. the direction of fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. Whatever we want, might want to call it, and I, <clears throat> whatever it was, it was an important book. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? We're going to do one more uh, sort of round table. Sure. <laughs> All right, let's get that. Uh, where is the sense of hope <laughs> in Jesus' words? Then you have that conversation here and can go a little deeper. Are there signs? We'll take a little less time just so that we can have, have a moment at the end to wrap up. But maybe four minutes. Where do you see signs of hope in Jesus' words? How can you not be hopeful about God's world when you're looking at things like this? I mean, Where it's stunning. Oh, Banff, Canada. Oh, my God. Oh, no. <laughs> you guys are going to take a deep for a second. Right? <laughs> we're going to say hi to Gretchen, who's in Banff, Canada. Oh. <laughs> it's a tough life, Gretchen. Oh, yeah. Gretchen, first time I thought it was like one of those like photo backgrounds. I told you. <laughs> <laughs> it's like your yeah, actual, that's the actual background. background. Wait a minute. If it's oh. if it's nine forty here, what time is it in Banff, oh, yeah. Canada? Sunrise. <laughs> Uh, it's seven forty. That's why I'm at the gym. So yeah, okay, like yeah. I said, I'm doing my spiritual and oh, yes. physical workout right now. Yeah, that's <laughs> oh my god, that's amazing. amazing! And it's cold out here, so I'm going back inside. Right. <laughs> Thank you for giving us a view of that for a second. All right. Anyone want to share? Uh, where do you see signs of hope? Just that um, what you can see many times is not real mm. it's not ultimate reality and what's what is is hidden it's invisible it's hard to mm. um explain mm. so in other words you my friend used the word inverted mm. you know upside down yeah i 
mentioned in our small group that Jesus's promise that when we get hauled up before the authorities, Jesus will give us the words. Mm -hmm. More than once when I found myself in a situation that I really didn't want to be in that required me to explain something, I think I've I've looked at that and hoped mm. that it was there. I'm not sure that it always panned out, you know, but but there was hope in the that promise. Mm. I don't know if it's a sign, but um, I think they all, they all they say that you have a certain way of life and you help others mm -hmm. that you will be uh, saved, you know, mm -hmm. when it's time. Mm -hmm. I think it's, I don't know where the, where the quote is in the Bible, but I think the paraphrase of it kind of. Mm -hmm. I didn't say this in our group, but sometimes I think about the world is so scary. And uh, then I look at how many women, Audrey included, who are choosing to start, you know, have children. Mm -hmm. And there's hope in that. Our daughters have one in the other. It's just, it, it's, I stop and think. I was at the doctor the other day looking at some lateral, bipolar, whatever, look at the ear. Mm -hmm. Imagine that's happening in this little tiny baby. Mm -hmm. God's doing this magical, wonderful gift. And there's going to be, there are new people every day, new mm -hmm. babies. And so yeah. that's, that gives me hope that yeah. people, they, the parents have hope. So shouldn't mm -hmm. we all? Uh, and, and taking off what Claire said, I'm at my worst when I'm in panic. And when mm -hmm. I say things I don't mean, and I make decisions that I shouldn't have made. Mm. And, um, and, but hopefully there's a lesson there, which is to say during those times, the richest point, be within yourself mm. and have peace mm. and allow that contentment to control what you say and what you do. Easier said than done. Sure. But I find that if you have that opportunity, you should take it. Don't panic. <laughs> if you were living, oh, Craig. Yeah, I, I'm just saying. I I go back to the simple, but hopefully not simplistic words of uh, Reverend Fred Rogers in <laughs> signs of yeah. tragedy and signs of calamity. Look toward the helpers. Look mm -hmm. toward the quiet saints who are repairing the situation who are just doing their job without any fanfare or, or uh, expected rep recompense in return. When I look at people such as this, that is how I receive my hope. So imagine for a moment, you are one of Mark's original intended readers. Maybe during, or before, perhaps immediately after the destruction of the temple, a time of revolt. What signs of hope when you hear Jesus' words? Or where have you looked for signs of hope? Like maybe was it that temple? Right? If you're standing over and against that temple that's now being destroyed, and you hear the words of Jesus, are there signs of hope there? I, I would say that rebuilding, that to rebuild, okay, you see all the fires that are occurring here in Morristown, and those churches are being rebuilt. I think even Presbyterian Church has. By our 1700s or 1800s over there. over there, okay. And 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 so the hope is is that the congregation, the people, are going to rebuild this facility so that we could continue. Or maybe it's not about the facility itself. <laughs> or, wow, Look at these big stones. You know what? It's not about the stones, people, but <laughs> but people. Yes. Yeah. 
So um, there was one commentary that I read that I that I liked in particular, and I thought just as a way of closing, I would share these words. Um, these are not mine. Uh, living with uncertainty was hard for the first century followers of Jesus, and it's just as hard for his 21st century disciples as well. The promise God offers us in Christ, however, is not that if we just work hard enough, are pious enough, make ourselves acceptable enough, or attain enough, we'll leave all our uncertainties and insecurities behind. Indeed, let's go ahead and slide. Indeed, the Christian faith does not offer an end to uncertainty or insecurity at all. Rather, it promises that we can discover who we are only in relation to whose we are as we receive our identity as beloved children of God, who created and sustains all things and loves us unconditionally. The antidote to uncertainty, it turns out, isn't certainty, but courage. And the best response to insecurity is the confidence that comes from knowing that God esteems you worthy of dignity, honor, and love. Rooted in these promises, we are better equipped to resist all pretenders to throne, and give our allegiance to the one who gave all things for us. Thanks, Gudita. Mm -hmm.